If you don't watch the video right now, then... Oh, wait, my mistake. Today's topic is Nonviolent Communication by Marshall Rosenberg. Now that's interesting. We'll have a look at that. Welcome to the Soft Skill Channel. My name is Sebastian Jung and today I'd like to present to you Nonviolent Communication, developed by Marshall Rosenberg. Rosenberg was an American psychologist and he was a student of Carl Rogers, as was Thomas Gordon. Rogers developed client-centered therapy and he developed active listening that was also heavily used by Gordon. So this is the general area we are uh, in today. Uh, there are lots of relations to Rosenberg's work. But let's start at the beginning. Rosenberg says that the communication we use in our day-to-day -day lives, the way we interact with each other, is life-alienating and it is almost violent because we judge each other, we blame, we criticize, and this is not a good, a good way to deal with each other. And Rosenberg developed an alternative approach. Um, that is supposed to, to be a language that is more natural, that is a language of life. And that is nonviolent communication. This contrast between our day to day language and nonviolent communication was illustrated using animals. Rosenberg always had a jackal for our usual day to day. Uh, way of communicating, that is jackal language. Now, this is actually a wolf, I have to admit. Uh, there aren't many, many jackal dolls in Germany because it's not such a common animal, but uh, the difference isn't that great. So, now you have to be a jackal, jackal language. And for a nonviolent communication, Rosenberg used a giraffe. That one's cute. He uh, used the giraffe because giraffes have a long neck, they can oversee everything and they have a big heart. So giraffes were used for nonviolent communication. Rosenberg used these hand puppets first in workshops and seminars for children, but later he started using them in all of his seminars. And often he also had a small clip on ears, wolf ears and giraffe ears, so he could demonstrate listening as a wolf, uh, jackal, listening as a jackal or listening as a giraffe. So, what is nonviolent communication all about? It is all about empathy, about giving and receiving empathy, giving and receiving compassion, about forming an empathic connection to the other person, um, about gaining a kind of mutual understanding. The factual topics, they play quite a subordinate role. The big challenge is establishing this emphatic connection. And once we've done that, the factual topics won't be that big of a problem. I think a quote by Rosenberg illustrates the general idea very well. He said, um, don't go up in people's heads. It's ugly there. Go into their hearts. Because if you, if you try to look into people's heads, the thoughts that go in there, they may be unpleasant. You may not like them. But if you focus on the hearts, there are the feelings and needs that are mutual to all of us. And there we can form a connection. So, as you see, um, nonviolent communication is quite a fundamental shift in thinking. It is a different approach, a different way of dealing with each other and dealing even with ourselves. It is not a mere technique where you follow some steps to accomplish something, but it is more of a whole philosophy that you really need to understand to be able to use it properly. Rosenberg uh, himself called it a model or a process. And that we should keep in mind when we uh, continue to the more specific parts, to the four components of nonviolent communication. Let's start with an example here. 
The Jackal says, you never listen to me. Rosenberg says, this is a quite a tragic situation, because clearly the Jackal is in pain, the Jackal is suffering, there is something he needs. And this way, you never listen to me, he's not likely to get it. What do you think the reaction will be? No, that's wrong, I do listen to you, you're an idiot, something like that. So he won't get his needs met this way. So the giraffe approach is entirely different. It focuses on four components and those are observations, feelings, needs and requests. First are observations. We describe what we perceive, what we see here and so on. And the big challenge here is to describe our observations without including any kind of judgment. If I uh, say, for example, uh, you were pretty rude earlier, this is not an observation, it is a judgment. I perceived your behavior as being rude. Um, oh, wrong animal. This is for the checker to say, you were pretty rude. Or if I say, uh, the living room is quite messy. Now, this may seem at an, like an observation at first glance, but actually um, it includes a judgment because I basically say there is a general standard of tidiness and I know what it is and I decide whether a room is tidy enough or not. So even this includes a judgment. And it also depends on the way you say things. If, I, if, if the jackal says, the toothpaste tube is not screwed shut, the, the phrasing indicates an observation. However, the way he, he says it clearly means, but it should be. And that, of course, is the judgment. So, you see, distinguishing between observation and judgment is not that easy. That is something we need to learn first. In our example, in the you never listen to me example, the giraffe uh, um, way of describing the observation could maybe sound like this. When I told you about my problems at work earlier, you were looking at your phone while I spoke and when I was finished, you didn't react in any way. Then we have the feelings, because if we make that observation we described, it uh, triggered some kind of feeling in us. And this again is not that easy, because we're not used to talking about feelings, and often we aren't even really aware of our own feelings. And uh, there is another trap here, because our language often really doesn't make it clear what a feeling is and what it's not. Now, um, this, is, this is true for, for English, it's also true for German and probably for several other languages. Um, there are plenty of sentences in English that include I feel, but they don't describe a feeling, such as I feel you don't listen to me. This clearly is a judgment again, not a feeling. And also, if I say something like I feel neglected, this is actually an interpretation and a judgment, not a feeling. What I basically say is I uh, um, interpret the behavior of others in the way that they are neglecting me. This is how I see, how I understand others' behavior. So this is a, a judgment, an interpretation about others. It is not a feeling of myself. In our example, the giraffe might say something like that. Now, when I made this observation, I felt sad and frustrated. After that, we have needs, because feelings are related 
to our needs. We have a feeling, a negative feeling, if there is a need that isn't met, that isn't fulfilled. A feeling is something we experience in the present moment and a need is something that's always there. For example, I always have a need for food, but I'm not permanently hungry. Most of the time maybe, but not always. Or I always have a need for closeness, but I don't always feel lonely. I only feel lonely if my need for closeness isn't met. Now, again, we are not used to dealing with our needs or even um, with the recognize, to recognize our needs. So this isn't easy for us. And there is another major challenge here. Because at this point, what we want to do is take responsibility for our feelings. Because we have those feelings due to a need of ourselves that isn't met. What the other person says or does might be the trigger for this feeling in this moment, but it's not the cause. The cause are our own needs, so we have to take responsibility for our feelings. We can't blame the other person. If I say something like, um, I'm angry because you didn't clean up, this isn't actually true. The other person didn't cause me to be angry. I'm angry because I have a need for tidiness that isn't met in this moment. But the other person isn't responsible for meeting my needs and making me happy. So this again is, is something we need to really grasp and understand first. In our example, it could sound like this. I felt sad and frustrated because I have a need for attention and support. And then finally, we have requests. Because after we described our feelings and our needs and the situation that uh, triggered them, we want something to change. We want to make a request to the other person. And the big challenge here is to make a request um, and not a demand. Now, distinguishing between request and demand is quite difficult. Rosenberg says you can tell apart a request and a demand just by hearing them. They sound pretty much the same. You can phrase a demand really nice and friendly. You will only know the difference if you don't do what the other person wants. If the other person says, oh yeah, well, that's fine. I, I only would have liked you to do it if it's really fine with you and if you are okay with doing it yourselves. Then it was a request. If the other person tries to punish us in any way, by sanctioning us in any way, by, by blaming us, by trying to invoke guilty feelings, by being upset, whatever, then, the, then it was actually a demand. Then it was, I want you to or else. And this we don't want. We don't want to make demands. Because even if the other person gives in to our demands and does what we want, it still creates a bad situation. It, it hurts us both. Now, we, we might end up with a situation where someone says, oh, for 20 years I, I did all your crap and now it's enough. And, and we certainly don't want something like that. So it will always lead to, to problems, to bad situations. We want to make a request. We want to ask something of the other person. And we don't want to force them to but we want them to do it if it is really fine with themselves. Now, this is a challenge because we are used, of course, to hearing demands. And even if we make a request, the other person will probably hear it as a demand. So what we can do here is to ask the other person to reflect back what they heard. So come here, giraffe. The giraffe might say, could you uh, tell me what you just heard. And then the jacket probably says, oh yeah, I, I must do uh, whatever. 
uh, and then the giraffe can say, ah, thanks for reflecting that back to me, for letting me know what you heard, uh, what I actually meant was, and so on and so on. And then we can clarify that. So having the other person reflect back what they heard is quite a useful technique. Uh, we will use that again uh, in a moment. Um, the phrasing is also very important when we make a request. Rosenberg says we should use positive action language. Positive means we tell the other person what we want, not what we don't want. We don't say, please stop doing whatever, please don't do whatever. Rosenberg has a funny anecdote there about a wife who to uh, told her husband, I don't want you to spend so much time at work. And then she was upset when the husband signed up for a golf tournament. So always tell them what you want them to do and make it specific, make it a specific action. If you ask them, for example, to listen to you, they will probably say, yeah, but, but I already do. You, you can't uh, differentiate, you can't tell by, by watching them if they listen or not. You should use a specific observable action. In our example, this could be something like, I want you to look at me while we talk. And when I finish telling you something, I would like you to give me a short reply, a short feedback. So in total, this uh, um, example, you don't, uh, you never listen to me in giraffe. It would sound something like that. When I told you about my problems at work earlier, you looked at your phone while I was talking. And when I uh, finished telling you about it, you didn't uh, respond. You didn't react in any way. And when I observed this, I felt sad and frustrated because I have a need for attention and support. And therefore, I would like to ask you to look at me while we uh, talk. And when I tell you something, I would like you to give me a short response, a short feedback. And uh, if you uh, really you don't want to talk at this mo in, in, in that moment, if you are um, dealing with uh, something else, if you are busy with uh, th something else, um, I would like you to, to tell me so. Would this be okay for you? This is what it could sound like in Giraffe. Now we discussed uh, extensively how we tell the other person about our feelings and needs and how we make a request. But this is actually not the first step. This usually comes much later. Because especially if we are dealing with someone who doesn't know nonviolent communication, what we need to do first is usually to give empathy and to receive, to, to try to understand what goes on in the other person, what is alive in the other person, as Rosenberg put it. So if we uh, stick to our example from before, oops. The, the jackal says, you never listen to me. Now, this is, of course, a judgment and a blaming, but the giraffe doesn't hear any, any judgment or blame. The giraffe listens for observations, for feelings, for needs and for requests. And the giraffe tries to figure out what is alive in the jackal in this moment. So the giraffe might ask, uh, would you like me to behave differently when, when we talk? Is, is that it? And the wolf says, oh, yes, I don't want to do any other crap. And, ah, this is what this is about. And then the giraffe never will continue to, to ask questions and to reflect back what she hears, reflect back the feelings and needs and make sure um, they, uh, she, she gets it right. She understands what is alive in the wolf, uh, in the check. <laughs> and over time, the giraffe will come to an understanding. And at the very end, maybe the giraffe will say something like, when I got home from work, I felt exhausted and tired, and I had a need for rest and relaxation. 
I would like to support you and be there for you, that this is an important need of mine, um, but in this moment I wasn't really able and prepared to do that. And would it be okay for you if in such a situation I would just let you know that I uh, don't want to speak right now and then we can speak later. Would this be okay for you? Uh, this is how, how that might turn out. So you see, creating this emphatic connection, this mutual understanding, isn't easy. It takes some work, it takes some effort. And again, an, a very important technique for doing that is the um, reflecting. So we reflect to the other person what we heard, what we think their feelings and needs might be. Because even if we are wrong, they will tell us so and they will give us further hints that uh, will help us better understand. And if we tell the other person something, it's a good idea to ask them to reflect it back to us so we can understand whether they received it and understood it in uh, the way that we intended or if maybe they heard something else. And this will happen frequently because, of course, we are used to hearing judgment and blame and demands. And if there is a giraffe approaching us with feelings and needs, which is totally un unusual for us, we might still hear blame and judgment and so on. So reflecting is very useful. It is important to understand that nonviolent communication doesn't mean that we are uh, super nice to the other person. It doesn't mean that we put our own needs aside uh, for the benefit of others. It also doesn't mean that we suppress our anger. We express our feelings, our needs. We even express our anger. We fully express all of that, but in a nonviolent way. For Rosenberg, nonviolent communication wasn't just a tool for communicating better, it was a way to social change and uh, towards peace. Rosenberg himself uh, did a lot of work in crisis areas such as the Middle East, Nigeria, Rwanda, Malaysia, and many others, where he used nonviolent communication to mediate between conflicting parties, often even between parties that were at war, that were killing each other, and he tried to bring about peace using his, uh, his method. So this is the the general uh, direction this all um, is intended for. So what should we do if we want to learn nonviolent communication, if we want to learn to use it? We discussed a couple of basics here in the video and this is already a, a big, big part of um, the concepts. Now there are uh, there is more material, um, especially in regard to how we apply nonviolent communication in specific situations, such as how do we proceed if we want to use nonviolent com communication uh, to mediate a conflict? Uh, how do we express anger? How do we express appreciation? There are specific steps for that. But those are, uh, that is more like details. In general, if we want to understand nonviolent communication, uh, learn it, get better at it, the important thing is to really understand the basic concepts, to really get a hold of that, to, to deal with ourselves, to learn to recognize our feelings, learn to recognize our needs, learn to better distinguish between observation and judgment and so on, to really get a grasp of all of that. Now, there are a couple of things that can be helpful. First of all, we have this book by Marshall Rosenberg, Nonviolent Communication, a Language of Life, which is uh, considered the standard book about the method. 
Furthermore, there are a couple of recordings of workshops, seminars given by Rosenberg that you can watch uh, here on YouTube. There is one workshop that is especially popular from 2000 from San Francisco and I will link to a recording of that in the video description below. Um, it is in four parts, total time is three to four hours. There you can, uh, if you want to see Rosenberg himself and hear some explanations from himself, uh, this could be very interesting for you. And finally, of course, there are workshops and seminars and the like that you can attend. And if you are interested in that, a good place to start is <clears throat> is the Center for Nonviolent Communication, which is the nonprofit organization founded by Rosenberg himself that is dedicated to promoting nonviolent communication. Um, it is an international organization, so you might find some uh, um, dates, some workshops, seminars in your country there. And there might also be local organizations supporting nonviolent communication in your country. Now, of course, um, I don't know all of those organizations and workshops and trainers and so on in, in detail. I can tell you which workshops are good and which are maybe not so good. Um, what could be helpful is to check if the trainer uh, holding the workshop has some certification. The Center for Nonviolent Communication certifies trainers and there might also be local organizations in your countries that do so as well. And if you have a workshop held by a certified trainer, this is a good indication that it's probably one of the better offerings. What can we do with nonviolent communication if we learn it? Now, first of all, it can be helpful in communicating with ourselves, in dealing with ourselves, especially if we've done something that didn't work out that great. If we are unhappy with ourselves, then our inner monologue often uses plenty of, of blame and criticism and so on and we can apply nonviolent communication there. And I think this is a good first step to learn to better understand feelings and needs and so on. Rosenberg himself used nonviolent communication for mediation, as I said, in crisis areas and so on. Um, he used it in therapy. He was a psychologist and psychotherapist. He had a small private practice. And he, uh, of course, held plenty of workshops, seminars, where he taught nonviolent communication to people. And a lot of them wanted to learn it to better communicate with some people they had problems with, where the relationship was, was difficult, was troubled. Now, in therapy, nonviolent communication isn't used a lot nowadays. Uh, the biggest reason for that is that there is very little research about nonviolent communication and there is uh, little research about its effectiveness. So we don't really have a, a scientific proof for that. Um, learning nonviolent communication to better communicate with people, that is a good idea, I'd say. And I think this will work best if um, both parties do it together. So for example, if you are a couple and you say, oh yeah, we, we, we will both learn nonviolent communication together, maybe attend a workshop together or whatnot, so we can better communicate with each other. I think this is much easier uh, than if just one person learns it, because then you have uh, two giraffes talking to each other. And that, of course, is much easier than uh, if you have to translate the checker language. Um, and finally, of course, nonviolent communication is a nice tool for mediation. So if there is a mediator as a third party who knows nonviolent communication and explains it to both parties and uses it 
to uh, figure out the feelings and needs of both parties, helps to establish the empathic connection. Uh, this can work very well. However, this is clearly for advanced practitioners who have lots of experience and uh, know the method really well. Nonviolent communication has some relations, some overlap to other topics we already discussed or that we will discuss in the future. And this might also be interesting. First of all, as I said before, um, the, um, the methods developed by Rogers and Gordon are um, similar, especially active listening. Um, so active listening might be interesting for you if you are interested in nonviolent communication um, as an uh, um, additional, additional tool. Uh, furthermore, there is a lot of overlap with the concept of mindfulness. Um, as you might recall in mindfulness, distinguishing between observations and judgment is also quite important and in nonviolent communication, we also have this very strong idea of being present in the current moment, especially when you are listening to the other party. You should really be there with them and you should be present. So um, if you are interested in nonviolent communication, mindfulness might also be interesting for you and the other way around. And finally, I think um, it can be combined uh, very well with the model of the inner team by Schulz von Thun because both deal with this inner monologue of ourselves and how we treat ourselves and I think um, it can be combined very well. Finally, we should talk about problems and possible risks. Now, first of all, as I said before, uh, little res there is little research into the effectiveness of nonviolent communication. So uh, uh, things are a bit vague there. There are only anecdotes, but not a lot of scientific studies. Um, I didn't look into scientific studies for the video because this would have exceeded my capacities, so I can't give you a lot of details there. And then a big problem is that nonviolent communication is basically very simple. The basic concepts are quite simple, quite easy. However, to really understand it, to really... Um, uh, get get into it is not that easy and it is um, quite uh, unusual for us at first so I guess there is uh, room for difficulties there. First of all I could uh, quite imagine a situation um, let's say we have two people in a relationship and uh, one, one suddenly starts uh, um, um, using nonviolent communication and says oh when I was in the bathroom, I just noticed the toothpaste tube is unscrewed. And when I observed this, I felt frustrated and, and angry because I have a need for tidiness that isn't met in this moment. And so I would like to ask of you and so on. And the response could probably be something like, are you kidding me? Are you trying to pull some kind of therapy with me here? Because it's, it's so unusual to um, hear this kind of talk, hear reference to feelings and needs and so on. So this might be a di bit difficult at the beginning. And furthermore, um, since all those concepts aren't that easy to, to grasp, um, we might end up with people who try to use nonviolent communication, but uh, haven't really grasped all of the concepts yet and uh, this might lead to, to uh, let's say, problematic results, to uh, check a language in giraffe for example, if we end up saying, oh no, this isn't right, this isn't a, a proper feeling, this isn't a correct need, say it properly in nonviolent communication. Um, or um, it could, could lead to, to strange results, for example, if we 
I haven't grasped the distinction between request and demand yet, and we end up uh, um, yeah, with an approach like, I want you to do and I want you to do it voluntarily and happily. Now, and this wouldn't, of course, make any sense. So there is room for problems there. But I still think it is a nice method. I think it is um, worthwhile to learn it. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, I think there is lots of potential there as long as we don't underestimate it, as long as we understand that it is not a simple technique where we just follow some steps and it will work, but that it is something that we really need to get into and really understand. I guess you, you made a good start by watching such a lengthy video as this, opposed to some five to 10 minute introduction, but even this long video, of course, uh, won't make you an expert in nonviolent communication. It is merely a starting point. But if you if you build on this, make small steps and uh, use some tact, I think it will work out fine. If you enjoyed the video, I would uh, ask you to click the like button and maybe subscribe to the channel. Uh, that would make me quite happy and uh, meet my need for recognition and appreciation. We will see each other again next week. Um, for today, I'll take my leave. Have a nice day. See you next time.